first speaker, um, the main historian speaker, is Margot Anderson. She is distinguished professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she specializes in the social history of the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. She is the co-author of the Encyclopedia of the U.S. Census from the Constitution to the American Community Survey. Margo. Thank you very much. Can, I, can you, everybody hear me? There we go, okay. Um, uh, the the um, logic of that uh, picture will be obvious in a minute. Um, first of all, I'd really th like to thank um, uh, the organizers and the academy and my colleagues and friends who've come this afternoon or this morning for this uh, session. This has been a really interesting um, uh, seminar for me just to see the variety of topics and uh, I, like Ruth yesterday, I was scribbling notes madly trying to figure out how to get everything in I want to say and I obviously won't. So. Um, the, so uh, I will, but I will try to make, you know, sort of tie up some themes to some of the other things we've been talking about as uh, I go on. My task here is to talk about uh, the federal statistical system. Uh, the topic of the session is actually vital statistics and biodemography. I hope to show you um, how those two things um, connect um, before I'm done. Um, the, the two committees that I'm going to focus on in the division of, um, uh, of social and behavioral sciences in um, the academy are SINSTAT and CPOP, the Con Committee on National Statistics and uh, the Committee on Population. Okay. To do this, I'm going to give us a, back, a bit of a background on the federal statistical system, and uh, because I think that um, the, there's a kind of uh, sort of understory, non-story that I need to tell before we um, go further. Essentially, um, I'm going to suggest that the that there's some very old history here of the federal statistical system, where which only comes to uh, connect really strongly with the academy in the last half century. So there's a there's sort of 150 years, if you will, that um, I want to sort of very briefly trace, and with some in, um, discussion of sort of what else is going on at the ranch um, while the academy is also in development. So, in particular, the history of the federal statistical system is connected with the founding of the state, as we'll see in a minute. Um, and what you have here is a timeline of the statistical system and the and key events in the academy. Um, um, today, the, the federal, what we call the federal statistical system, um, is uh, all the federal government agencies of about that um, that produce uh, official statistics. About $6.8 billion in 2013. 40% of it is in 13 lead agencies. Um, there are 98 federal agencies that produce statistics. Um, they, by and large, um, create and uh, codify the major classification systems of the social sciences. Uh, they also set data stewardship and confidentiality standards for the social sciences. They also archive, uh, preserve, and generally distribute the uh, statistics and methods produced free to the public. We recently saw what this was like when things like census.gov got shut down with the um, uh, shutdown. And they're sort of all just there, like an old shoe, um, uh, ready for all of our use. Because of that, we don't necessarily see them as science, because they're just sort of part of the background information that we all live with. But the, um, the, the, uh, the rest of the infrastructure of the social sciences, theory output in fields such as demography, political science, uh, consumer behavior, labor force dynamics, income and wealth, education, crime and justice, all depend on the data that is produced in the federal statistical system. Um, now, the, the official, the, the um, United States has what is called a decentralized um, statistical system embedded in the structure of the American, um, building of the American state in the Constitution. 
the, um, we have uh, two legs, if you will, of the statistical system. One is based on survey data. The foundational instrument is the census. The foundational constitutional provision is Article I, Section 2 of the Constitution. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included in this union according to their respective numbers. And then the rest goes on and says how Congress, note this, will mandate the census. The, um, we have taken 23 decennial censuses since 1790. Um, the, the agency that produces uh, that data has grown into the nation's premier survey research organization, the, the U.S. Census Bureau. The second leg of the statistical system is the, what is the, uh, derives from the administrative data systems that are produced uh, by the American state. Um, and these come from slightly different provisions of the Constitution, namely that we have, um, that, that the expenditures and accounts of public money shall be published, which means that they will be open and available to the public, and that the president is required um, from time to time to present the state uh, to Congress, uh, the State of the Union. Those provisions meant that the very early in the Amer development of the American state, administrative statistics were both compiled but also published, so that by 1810, we begin to get um, uh, statistical comp compilations being produced and the administrative structures to collect, codify, standardize, and so forth, all of that. Okay, hence my slide, which is the infrastructure of the 1790 census. Um, this is a picture with um, the results of the 1790 census um, by states, therefore the um, distribution of members of Congress uh, among the states embedded in our nation, right? The um, actual production of the, the, the data, if you will, um, the raw data actually was collected, we, we've also held on to, and the book that actually came out of this was about 60 pages long. Now, what I'm gonna show very briefly is how um, this developed over, um, the, um, over time. Essentially, throughout the 19th century, you see the growth of the science of statistics, both inside the government and um, in the professionalization of the field. Um, the American Statistical Association was founded in 1839, um, in other words, a generation before the academy. In, with a foot in both the mathematical and the social sciences. By the time that the um, uh, Research Council was found, was established in 1916, the Census Bureau was by then a permanent agency in the Commerce Department, collecting not only the population census, but uh, censuses of agriculture, manufacturing, government operations, religious organizations, and finance. So here we see the beginnings of uh, the, the, you know, the, essentially the, the administrative, in, the, um, the survey infrastructure of, a, of the state. This is a painting from 1853, for, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, the census also, of course, is deeply embedded in our popular culture, and so we also get cartooning and um, census taking, again, the same model. And this is basically the model that we still use in many ways. Um, and the, um, um, the, what, one of the great discoveries of the American uh, statistical, federal statistical system was just how fast the American population was growing compared to its uh, comparator states in Britain and France. That in turn also leads to um, technical innovation in the process of census taking because of course hand tabulation methods and tallying and classification schemes um, when you're dealing with ever increasing numbers like this, you know, basically almost brought down um, the, uh, the process. So even though the, 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 you know, we get more and more and more publications coming out of the census in the 19th century, we also find um, uh, that the, the office and the, the technology of it is, you know, is, is collapsing under the, tech, uh, under the problems. The result is the development of uh, what we call machine tabulation. This is the um, 1890s uh, census innovation of converting uh, the census to punch cards and then tabulating the punch cards. Um, this, of course, the company, Hollerith Company, that built this turns into IBM, right? Um, and the Census Bureau will go on from here and the federal statistical system to be innovators in, machine, in uh, data processing from then on. 
Um, here's the, the, you can see the evolution of the punch cards here. The, this is the 1900 punch card with the 80 column uh, IBM card that supersedes it some 30 or 40 years later. Um, um, the, on the other side of the divide, the administrative statistics divide, the, um, the main work is being done out of the Treasury Department initially and the statistical abstract of the U.S., uh, which again begins to compile and, pro and provide, um, you know, the record of all sorts of domains of um, uh, American life which become the basis for the social sciences, but also some of the natural sciences, as you can see here. Uh, population, finance, commerce, agricultural, uh, um, exports, mining, railroads, telegraphs, immigration, education, public lands, all of this is put, you know, is published starting again in 1878 um, yearly uh, and developed into time series um, uh, collections um, thereafter. Now, the, the, um, the fact of the, these, these kinds of systems existing um, makes it possible for um, the, as I said, the, you know, the, the, the statistical sit the world to develop and for the, um, the, the leaders of the system essentially to become the major leaders in, um, in uh, American science as well. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, Francis, uh, Census Director Francis Amasa Walker, uh, director in the 1870s and 80, 1880s, was also the president of MIT. He was a uh, president of the American Statistical Association and also the founding president of the American Economic Association. So you see, if you look back in, even in the member biographies of the, of the, um, the academy in the 19th century, um, people who cross many disciplinary lines in this, this amorphous period before the disciplines are um, sorted out. Okay, now, the, the problem is, is that the, the system is decentralized, and this will uh, ultimately lead to how the academy will come into the, the story, if you will, 40, 50 years later. Um, the re because of these two legs, um, the administrative statistics were, was on one channel, the survey statistics on another, mostly because the Census Bureau was not made permanent until 1902. Um, the um, classification schemes, some of the standards, some of the reporting mechanisms were um, contradictory and produced con um, confused data. Um, Presidents Roosevelt, Roosevelt, and Hoover all tried to deal with this and all failed. Um, they finally figured out how to live with what was called a decentralized statistical system in the 19, uh, in the, around the time of World War II, which is that in the cons consolidation of the Bureau of the Budget, um, a, a position of chief statistician was created. And uh, in 1942, as a, almost as a war measure, the for, formal for Federal Reports Act mandated what was called forms clearance um, that allowed a, the, you know, the, the central um, statistical office, the, the central coordinating office, the Office of Statistical Standards, to try to begin to, begin to pull this system together. Now, what's interesting is that there, the, that um, all, you know, all three presidents um, actually were hoping um, for ultimately a central system that looks a little bit more like the Canadian model. And it never happened, um, and that's what I want to talk about next. Um, meanwhile, uh, within the decentralized system, therefore as, particularly in the 1930s and later, as the um, instrumentalities of the welfare state are being developed and born, in particular the social security system that you have here, they don't piggyback on the existing systems so that, for example, um, Social Security Board uh, contracts directly with IBM to build its, its population data system for um, Social Security and registration. Meanwhile, the Census Bureau is working on computerization and builds the first non-defense computer UNIVAC for the 1950 census. So they're still working at cross purposes. Now, there are visions that um, about bringing together these things and social scientists um, begin to see the potential of merging data systems um, and building, you know, um, and building them together. The, uh, there's also a debate about, um, there's also, we also put in a, a, a major draft 
um, system, 16 million men are registered during World War II. We do alien registration starting in 1940. So the systems are being built at, this, at the national level. Okay, what, in 1942, um, an interagency organization um, uh, that was supported particularly by the Census Bureau and the, um, uh, the War Department proposes to do a total population registration as a war measure and to build uh, a population register as the United, as other European nations had done so. And this is a model of the form that was being proposed, right? Um, it would be obviously serve statistical purposes, but it would also fix an individual's identity for all sorts of administrative functions. And of course, this, um, I love this graphic because this was how it was supposed to work. Um, you started on the left and you um, registered and it went into an office. And of course, I don't know if I can um, show you this, but it, see, if, if you were John Doe and you moved from Maine to Los Angeles, your identity papers went with you, right? So this is a really serious effort at understanding the population dynamics and, and control. And this is a slightly larger version of it. Right? Looks sort of like the Affordable Care Act uh, rollout models. Right? Uh, now, you're not gonna be able to read this terribly well. I'll blow up some of this. But the, there's a, a big fat report that goes with this on the uses of, the, of population registration systems. Right? And here is the national registration system will serve manifold uses. Um, um, we will fix the personal identity of all the people, the knowledge of who a person is and where he is located. The service will be made available in such a way that it can be used in every part of the country. Um, uh, it will be linked by means of an identity number. Vast sources of information on individuals at present are unavailable on, on, um, as correlated knowledge. Now, the problem was that this was wartime, and it immediately got tangled up into the debates about um, uh, national security and population control. Um, this is, there were nine questions about why we should do this, and, what, and how does the national registration aid in war plant protection? How can a national registration aid in the control of aliens? How can a national registration aid in the control of espionage or satis, sabotage, and so forth? And this one, of course, raises the question of how we can control the civilian population. Of course, this is while we had over 100,000 Japanese, uh, Americans of uh, Japanese ancestry in concentration camps. Uh, the identity number of the person can be dyed to wartime internal passport. Um, the control can be exercised um, in the degree that is necessary for the war effort. Uh, what happened, of course, is that as this moved through the bureaucracy and reached the upper levels of the Bureau of the Budget, it was scotched and it never came forward over and the reports by then were direct comparisons with the, um, what, the, what was going on in Nazi Germany, and um, it, it, it died as a registration system. The effect, the effect though, on the statistical system was that, it, that the vital statistical system, which is the records of birth, deaths, and marriages, um, that had been collected and processed by the Census Bureau was moved out of the Census Bureau uh, that championed this system um, to the Public Health Service. And so we separated again the administrative, uh, uh, we, we, we then, we decentralized even further the, the coordination of statistics. Now, in the 1960s, um, we come back again to this. And Kingsley Davis, how am I got two minutes, good. Um, comes, uh, who's an academy member, um, proposes along with uh, the Na Social Science Research Council and the Office of Management and Budget Office um, to create, to, 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 now that we have really fancy computers, to centralize this. This hits Congress and goes, again, nowhere, um, as you can see. Um, and, we, and it opens up the privacy debates, um, some of which, and the suspicion of science that you, you heard a little bit about in the last panel. Uh, why, why do we care? Well, because, of course, what Congress does when, and the President does when they're faced with these kind of dilemmas is they create another commission. So they created the Federal Statistics Commission, which, and the Wallace Commission, which recommended um, the establishment of this Committee on National Statistics. At the same time, Philip Handler was, uh, was becoming the Academy's new president and, was, um, and one of his initiatives was to, bring, to increase the presence of the social sciences. 
Um, there are a whole slew of new members of the academy in the 70s who are come out of the federal statistical system. Uh, Ansley Cole in 1973, right? Robert Fogel in 1973, Otis Dugley Duncan in 1973, Fred Mosteller, a member of this commission in 74, Philip Hauser, Morris Hansen from the Census Bureau in 1976, Nathan Kiefitz from Canada in 1977, uh, and this will continue. Um, so essentially what you, and since that then becomes the institutionalization of the, uh, the, the tie between the academy and the federal statistical system in terms of methods and um, statistical planning. The Committee on National, St the Committee on Population has a slightly different um, uh, origin, and as we heard little bits of yesterday, a much more troubled one, um, because it because the Academy is tangled up with the um, debates about population control, uh, IQ t measurement. So we have Kingsley Davis proposing the data bank on the left, and of course Kingsley Davis on the right, saying, uh, quote, with a sneer, the federal government is spending millions of dollars under the illusion it is getting population control. So what essentially what and there's a whole there's a huge literature. You know, public literature on this. The upshot of it is, is that when the pop, when um, when the when the uh, committee is established in, in '83, it does not trace its legacy back to these earlier th issues. So, and we talk about historical memory here. Um, and what I want to conclude with is just an image of the um, the reports. I just pulled some of the census ones. The for the, uh, for the Academy, the, the SINSTAT is very, very, has produced 242 public reports since its founding, uh, uh, 181 of them in the last uh, 20 years. This is the, these are the reports from the census uh, and the American Community Survey, uh, and uh, as well as some of the technical issues. The, they have begun, they have produced principles and practices for a federal statistical agency. This is the fifth edition of that, um, uh, that publication. And the Committee on Population, meanwhile, moved into the discussion of uh, biodemography and, um, and the, merge, the reconnection of the biological sciences with the social sciences. Okay, I'm hoping we'll get some follow up on that. So, we are, this is the National Archives. Um, um, it's a pretty, you know, it's a very grand notion. And if you go to look at the statue in the front, you get a little, um, you will see the, the the, um, uh, the uh, inscription, what is past is prologue, and so I will a end with a question of where have we been and where are we going? Thank you. Thank you Lord. Our first panelist, as you no doubt have noticed, is not here. Um, I'm going to introduce him, and I'm also going to re read the remarks that he, he sent us uh, to be read in his absence. Uh, but before I do both of those things, I want to say that there are many reasons why it is regrettable that Bob Hauser couldn't be with us this morning. And one of them is that he's the person who basically had the idea for this entire two and a half day uh, symposium. Um, and he's the one who um, pushed it through uh, the Academy bureaucracy, and he's the one who organized it. And, or he was the chief, the head of the committee that organized it. Um, so uh, it, it was with great re regret that I have to uh, introduce him in his absence. Uh, Robert Hauser is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's also executive director of the National Research Council's Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences, otherwise, and Education, otherwise known as DBAS. He served for 41 years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he was professor of sociology and founder of the Center for Demography of Health and Aging. He is also not the same Dr. Hauser that figured in Margot's history of... Um, his uncle. He's, he's, he is the nephew of that. Yeah. Dr. Hauser. Um, so uh, here um, is his text that he asked one of us to read this morning. For any number of reasons, I deeply regret my inability to join personally in this session of the Arthur M. Sackler Colloquium. 
on the sesquicentennial history of the National Academy of Sciences. All the same, I should like to offer these notes as an elaboration of Margot Anderson's reference to the role of the National Institute on Aging in the work of the Committee on Population and the Worldwide Development of Population Science. In the early years of the Committee on Population, um, he doesn't mean the earliest years of the Committee on Population. In the early years of the Committee on Population, much of its activity focused indeed on population growth, especially on fertility control, and the relationships between population growth and economic development. Despite the continuation of rapid population growth in some parts of the world, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa, there was a sharp decline in demand for NRC work in this area. Some of the factors in this decline were the success of family planning programs in some parts of the world, a replacement of concerns about population growth and family planning per se with those of women's empowerment and economic growth. Another, I suspect, was change in the research agendas of the Agency for International Development, AID, and the major, and the major foundations that once supported research on population growth and policy. For example, despite projections of continued growth in the world's population to 10 billion, and of increasingly de deleterious effects of global climate change, DBAS has been unable to win support for any large-scale study of sustainability and economic conditions in the, in the context of these projections. As those issues have declined in the CPOP portfolio, that is the Committee on Population, since the mid-1990s, the committee has had major support from the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the NIH Institute for the Research on Aging. With guidance from the exceptionally creative leader of that unit, Richard Sussman, CPOP has increasingly and productively focused on issues related to the causes and the consequences of population aging. This work began with the seminal edited volume, The Demography of Aging, which was published in 1995. Since then, CPOP has produced a mix of consensus reports, edited volumes, workshop reports, now numbering more than two dozen. Rather than enumerating all of these, I would mention four highly influential themes of the series, which have had enormous influence on the science of population aging. First, CPOP's work has led to increasing interdisciplinarity in studies of population aging, and in particular to the integration of biomedical, genomic, economic, social, and psychological research. The first contribution to this theme was an edited volume called From Zeus to Salmon, published in 1997, which dealt, and I'm quoting now, with such diverse topics as the role of the elderly in other species and among human societies past and present, the contribution of evolutionary theory to our understanding of human longevity and intergenerational transfers, mathematical models for survival, and the potential for collecting genetic material in household surveys." End quote. This work and its sequels is now complemented by a current study of new cross-species developments in biodemography. Second, CPOP's contributions have, provide, have provided a series of motivating, illustrative, and instructive reports on the inclusion of biological measures in social surveys. Here, the lead contribution was a volume called From Cells to Surveys, published in 2001, and most recently, Conducting Biosocial Surveys, published in 2010. Third, with leader leadership from the NIA, CPOP has contributed to the development of an international cohort of longitudinal biosocial surveys of aging and health. There are now more than two dozen such surveys around the world, located mainly in and around Europe, as well as the US. In the recent past, CPOP has conducted workshops, 
produce, and produced reports that encouraged the development of such surveys in Asia. And a project now underway at DBAS will undertake a similar project that focuses on aging in Latin America. Fourth, CPOP has also addressed the factors in, U factors in U.S. longevity and mortality. Here the two key reports are explaining divergent levels of longevity in high income countries in 2011 and in 2013, U.S. health in international perspective, shorter lives, poorer health. At ages above 50, not only does life expectancy in the U.S. lag behind that in many other developed nations, but the growth in life expectancy falls short in international comparisons. Moreover, at all but the oldest ages, in almost every population group, the U.S. lags far behind many other nations, both in morbidity and in mortality. Finally, Social, behavioral, and environmental factors dominate strictly biological conditions. And the U.S. system of medical care in account, sorry, I, I need to rephrase that sentence in order to make it clear. And finally, social, behavioral, and environmental factors dominate strictly biological conditions and the U.S. system of medical, and the U.S. system of medical care in accounting for observed lags in morbidity and mortality. When I first read that sentence, I was astonished by it, and now I can't even phrase it correctly. <laughs> um, it, it basically, counterintuitively for me, says that the U.S. system of medical care is not as important as social, behavioral, and environmental factors in accounting for the observed lags in morbidity and mortality. Thus, the two major consensus studies in this area, both conducted via comparisons between the U.S. and other nations, have thoroughly debunked the widespread belief, which I held as well, that the U.S. is a world leader both in health and in longevity. Uh, our next panelist is Michael Hout, professor of sociology at New York University where his research interests include inequality, social change, demography, and quantitative methods. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, recognized for his statistical models of social mobility processes, which provided a unified approach that reconciled competing perspectives. He is the author of Century of Difference, How America Changed in the Last 100 Years and inequality by design. And before I turn the microphone over to you, I hope I pronounced your surname correct. Okay, Michael. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, and uh, it's a great privilege and a pleasure to be here and part of this panel. Uh, Ken will talk to you in a minute about the future of the federal statistics. And Margo has obviously talked about the history of it, and Bob has been talking about the current activities of the, uh, of the Academy's panels that address the federal statistical system. I want to say I am a member of since that and very proud of the, of the work we do there, but I want to focus more on the interface between regular social scientists and the federal statistical system and how that has evolved basically since uh, Margot's last slide. Uh, <laughs> uh, or next to last slide. Until the 1960s, the Census Bureau and other federal statistical agencies gathered data, piled them up in DC, and produced the statistical abstract and census reports about places. But we did not get to see the detail about individuals for all of those privacy concerns that led to the headlines in the New York Times that, uh, that Margot shared with us. People are concerned that the data they give to the Census Bureau not get out and not be part of the public record. But from the perspective of researchers, we need to correlate a person's age and gender with their labor force status with their family income, with the income of other people in their family, and so on. 
That didn't used to be possible. But beginning in the 1960s, the Census Bureau and other federal agencies figured out ways to release to the research community what we call micro samples, anonymized data sets about people where we get all the information about an individual except their name and with enough of the geographical details stripped out that we can't impute who they are from how old they are and where they are. And so these anonymized data files have revolutionized how the social science of population is done. It has changed how we do our demography, our sociology, our labor economics, and uh, the sociology and demography of aging. And it's by this practice of sampling, anonymizing and releasing person records or micro samples that we've accomplished this. And it started in the mid-60s with a really crude one in 1,000 sample of the long form records from the 1960 census, but it quickly cascaded so that by the 1970 census, we had one in 100 samples from the long form respondents in three different flavors with different information stripped out so that if your interest was over here, you, you know, if your interest was in local context, you could get some detail about local context, but you wouldn't know precisely what occupation and industry a person was employed in. If your interest was occupation and industry, you wouldn't know exactly where the person was and so on. Um, also at that time, uh, a one in 100 sample from the 1960 census was, uh, was also released. And um, my dissertation's about those two. Uh, and uh, this was a, a huge boon to uh, labor economists, to sociologists, the family, and others. Of course, each data set had its own form and format, and so it quickly became a bit of an industry to first of all recover more data from manuscript censuses and other things. So at the University of Wisconsin, they uh, machine coded the 19 samples from the 1950 and then 1940 censuses uh, elsewhere work was done on 1910, 1900, and 1880 censuses, and uh, people, researchers could then get use, uh, get access to personal data, the complete person record for these anonymized samples from these data sets. But they were hard to use, they were hard to compare, and then a, uh, an institution called the IPUMS.org, use it for good, not evil, at the University of Minnesota began integrating all of these and the IPUMS collection now includes all the censuses from 1790 to 2010. Most of the current population surveys, the monthly unemployment survey that is done also by the Census Bureau, uh, um, and uh, they've now been uh, machine coded and, uh, and, and anonymized and uh, researchers can get, used, can get access to those through the University of Minnesota's uh, IPUMS.org website. The U.S. leadership in science and social science quickly caught hold uh, and, and these ideas began to spread so that other countries began releasing micro samples as well. The IPUMS website now releases 238 samples from 74 countries in micro, anonymized micro sample form. Uh, other survey, other organizations ha have uh, also compiled other kinds of social science data from across the world and harmonize them in ways that then make it possible to use a multi-country data set as if it was one study done uh, in all of the countries simultaneously. Ken's going to talk about it more, but an important uh, aspect of this is also linkages of some of these data files with administrative records, so that data from individuals about their work linked to data about their employers or data about their, uh, about their state uh, welfare system and so on. These kinds of data linkages usually then lead to the disclosure of who the person is. And so they aren't publicly available data sets that you can just download from a website. But if you go to a Census Bureau data center, you can then, and there are how many of them, Can I eight or nine across the country? 14. Oh, up to 14. Now, you can go to these and, make ac and, and get access to these linked records that um, if you're 
a trustworthy uh, researcher. Uh, you, uh, you can use it. These the computers involved in these data centers aren't linked to the internet very well, and you certainly can't make use of the, whatever linkages they have. They search your briefcase when you're leaving. Make sure you don't have a thumb drive full of uh, goodies, et cetera. But this protects the privacy of individuals while giving the social scientists access to all uh, sorts of these data. The Committee on National Statistics has been crucial in providing advice uh, on things such as disclosure analysis, where we test the data to make sure that they really are private and you can't identify individuals in them, sampling and, and many other topics. Since that also speaks up to the federal statistical agencies on behalf of the user community so that there isn't, you know, the default is always, oh gosh, it might leak out, therefore let's keep it. Um, but by speaking up on behalf of the user community, we've managed to get access to more and more over time, more and more of these, uh, of these important data. In my last two and a half minutes, I just want to give you a flavor for the kinds of things we've been able to learn based on these data. One of the, thing, one of the major things that happened over this period of the, disc of the release of these micro -sam uh, samples has been a revolution in who works uh, in the United States. The, uh, the labor force participation of women and uh, the withdrawal from the labor force of older Americans has been just a tremendous uh, change in our society. And because these things don't vary nearly as much from place to place, we would never have been able to get at the, 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 the actual processes involved in the decisions that members of households make that lead to some people going to work and others staying home and, and the role of pensions and the access to other people's income within a household income sharing in homes and so on on this important decision about who's going to work and who's not. Obviously the employers have some say in this too. The micro data, the access to the census micro samples have allowed us then to correlate the activities of individuals within their households, break it out by gender and age, education level and, and family income, and make tremendous progress in the sociology of the family and in the labor economics of labor force participation. Almost everything we know about income inequality in the United States comes from these data sources. Now some of it is reported by the census. Uh, they'll report 90-10 ratios and Gini coefficients. But the real detail on who is up and who is down in the inequality in, in the United States has been based on detailed analysis of these micro samples by sociologists and, uh, and demographers and labor economists. Social I'm going to close with the study of social mobility, which has lagged in the United States relative to the rest of the world because we lack the kind of registry that uh, Margot described for the United States. But the landmark study in all of this is Bob Hauser's 1973, and I, that's not a misstatement, it really was 1973, uh, study of social mobility was the last large national undertaking of, a, of, an, important, uh, of an important topic. Uh, but uh, Bob's, Bob's study of this was, uh, in collaboration with David Featherman, was, uh, was based on a supplement to the March Unemployment Survey of 1973 and, uh, and, and his access and Dave's access to the micro sample from that data set. Both set the tone for the other releases of, of micro sample data and, uh, and tell us still to this day much about, of what we know about social mobility in the United States. So I'll close there. final panelist is Ken Pruitt. Uh, Ken is the Carnegie Professor of Public Affairs and also the Vice President for Global Centers and also the Special Advisor to the President, all at Columbia University. Uh, Pruitt's professional career also includes Director of the United States Census Bureau, Director of the National Opinion Research Center, President of the Social Science Research Council, and Senior Vice President of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, this is a really bad starting slide in the midst of historians, because basically I should have said at the beginning of the 19th century, but I wasn't going to do the 19th century, so I'll just re refer to the 20th century. Um, I'm going to try to remind us that the panel is about infrastructure, 
and I'm going to try to give a bigger picture of the infrastructure of the social and so, social sciences and social statistics. I do not think, for all the reasons that you just heard, they cannot be disengaged. They're interactive, constantly feeding each other and, and so forth. Um, That's the right one. Okay. So two projects. Uh, the science project, right from the beginning, understanding human behavior, social structures, and we'll call it the nation building project, uh, strengthen democracy, economy, security, social welfare, and so forth. Uh, I, I think that describes not just the social sciences and social statistics, but for all the reasons that were in, in, in Dan's uh, uh, masterful overview uh, uh, earlier in this conference, uh, it's true across the sciences, but I know more about the social sciences. Um, now, the issue for me in these few minutes is what is the nature of the tension and why is it there? And what have we done about it? And my answer, which I signal right now, part of the reason for that tension is a failure of the social sciences, and I will talk about that failure. During the 20th century, nevertheless, the social sciences made tons of major breakthroughs. This is a small, small sample of, of what, um, what we could easily put on, this, uh, on these slides, a very, very small sample, um, and I won't bother to read it. Um, and especially after the Second World War, we began to build uh, what I would has, have described as a policy enterprise to sort of take the results of all of this good science and hand it over somehow to uh, the policymakers. Uh, that enterprise includes things like specialized institutes, think tanks, foundations, RFPs, contract houses, public policy schools. Um, the fifth or sixth line down there says specialized arrangements to facilitate access to federal statistics, exactly what uh, Michael was just talking about, evaluation research and so forth. And along with this enterprise, we have created a specialized vocabulary evidence-based policy, what works, performance metrics, ranking schemes. This is all a way to talk about uh, over here we've got knowledge and over here we have policy making and how does the connection get made or not get made and so forth. Now, in 1978, as all of this stuff is building and it's getting more and more professional and larger and the data sets are larger, or bigger social experiments, uh, the sorts of things, again, that, that Michael was talking about, uh, the kind of things that Sinstat was doing, that Margaret was doing. Well, uh, needless to say, uh, the Academy decided to have a, a report based upon um, how's it going. Um, and this is the cover of that book. And it says, The Uncertain Connection. Now, the word uncertain does not mean there is no connection. It does not mean there's a small or a large connection. It means they were uncertain. The report lists specific steps taken by the government to connect scientific knowledge and policy, and then says, we lack systematic evidence as to whether these steps are having the results their sponsors hope for. This is 1978, big science is going on, big social science is going on and so forth. We've created the contract houses, we've created or begun to create the access to federal statistics, uh, we've run social experiments, uh, we both put together the great society and then helped dismantle it. By the way, and that's an extremely important part of this story. It was the social sciences who began to ask serious questions about unintended consequences and so forth and so on, a great society legislation. Um, and uh, they had their own specialized foundations and their own publications, and they did a first-rate job of calling into question some uh, important aspects of, of, of the great society legislation. Um, so they said, what knowledge do we possess that is relevant to the formulation of what they called social R&D policy today? We'd call it evidence-based policy or, or some sort of other nomen part of that nomenclature. And they again conclude, regrettably and ironically, get back to that word, we possess little knowledge obtained through research that will help answer this question. The ironically in this report is here are the social sciences producing all of this social science knowledge, and they don't quite know, and it's kind of ironic. You would think the social scientists would have an answer to whether their stuff is being used or not. So, let's go to 2012. Using science as evidence in public policy. 35 years later, 
Here's a story I would like to tell you, but I can't because it's not true, but I will suggest it would be nice if it were true, that the leadership of the council, uh, the, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council, woke up one day and said, you know, we ought to take stock again. Remember that old report back in 1978 when they said there was an uncertain a connection? Well, let's, uh, let's, let's sort of see where we are now. Have we, made, have we got a more certain connection in mind? That's not what happened. Um, uh, 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 as Michael Foyer can tell, he was then the head of Deep Bass and he's here today. Um, it came out of a completely different conversation. In fact, the discovery of that 1978 report as a predecessor to this report was serendipitous. Uh, I could tell that little story, but it's not important. But, but when we started this project, nobody had said we ought to go back and see what we said in 1978 to see what. Now, however, having gone back to that 1978 report and having now engaged this report, I was the chair of, of, for this report, um, here is what we found out. In the 35 years since this report, the policy enterprise concerned with bringing social science to bear on policy has expanded, received more funding, become more professional, become larger, and all those kinds of things. And the conclusion reached in 1978 was the conclusion that we reached in 2012. We simply did not know. We weren't saying, we could tell endless anecdotes about efficacy, about impact, about consequences, but we had no persuasive, generalized statement to make. Now, the title of this report is Using Science as Evidence. This is very, very important. Not using social science as evidence, using any science as evidence. The title captures another argument. Using science as evidence in policy means it was, here's some findings, and it becomes evidence because it is used. It itself rests on its own evidence, but from the policy point of view, it becomes evidence for the taking of, the choice of, the dismantling of a, 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 a public policy uh, issue. And we met in here climate change uh, knowledge, knowledge on uh, 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 the, the, the panel we just heard today, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the panels. So we did not just mean social science because we do not think we have any, hand, any persuasive, generalized understanding uh, across any of the sciences. So the 21st century task, uh, understanding how, when, and why science is used in public policy. And I'm not going to summarize this report, except one of the things that we realize, it depends on getting inside the heads of the people who are making policy. And that's what we had not done. We had talked about getting the knowledge stronger. We talked about randomized field control trials and so forth, but we had not, we not grasped the idea that the use of science is a social phenomenon. It happens as people negotiate, uh, compromise, deceive, mislead, forget, misunderstanding. It happens in social settings, and we had not systematically looked at those social settings from the point of view of whether science is being used or not, congressional committees and so forth and so on. Now, the engineer can know that the bridge falls down unless you do certain kinds of, follow certain engineering principles. The physicist can tell us the weapon, weapon won't work unless. Uh, the epidemiologist can know the disease will spread unless. But we can't expect these sciences to answer the question of whether that knowledge will be used. That's not what they are trained to do. It's a social phenomenon of the use. It's not an epidemiological or physical or a mathematical or a biological phenomenon. And therefore, um, if we do this again, this report again in 35 years, and we conclude the same thing, it will be a failure of the social and behavioral sciences, not of any other science. For that reason, evidence, now just very quickly, and I'll get back to the final sentence, but evidence-based policy is a slogan. It doesn't actually say what's happening, except in very rare instances. That is one of the results of the report. I put this little number in here. As best we could tell, in 2011, uh, it, it was about less than a half a percent of the policies uh, that we could detect in the, in the uh, discretionary budget could really be tracked to something we called evidence-based policy. Therefore, we believe that the metaphor that makes sense is something we call evidence influence politics. It's descriptively accurate. It tells us what actually happens. And we think it's normatively appropriate because democratic politics is the venue of policy making, not the social sciences. 
So here's my final comment. The situation we're in now, where we're worried about defending the social sciences, and then, and as this academy recognizes, if, 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 if you can actually attack a social science, you can attack any science. And there's been an enormous response to the current attack on the social sciences and the current attack on the social statistical system as well um, uh, by this academy uh, because it understands that we are tinkering with science policy in this country right now. And part of the reason that we are somewhat vulnerable is we could not really systematically, persuasively explain the impact, the consequences, uh, the return on investment, whatever vocabulary you want to use, uh, to, uh, to our congressional uh, funders, uh, or the administrative uh, agencies. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not doing it. It doesn't mean we're not having enormous impact. We're not enormously important, but it's our testimony that we keep, keep making that claim, and the reply that comes back is, well, give us, give us the evidence of that. Thank you. Um, I have uh, jotted down two questions, which I hope um, will stimulate our discussion. Uh, but there are also questions that arise from the task before uh, Peter Westwick, Dan Kevlis, and me, that is to somehow write a history of this institution, this complicated and complex institution. So I'm going to just read them both out and do with them what you will or change them all together if you think appropriate. First question has to do with locating, um, you pronounce it Sinstat? In um, the NRC. Has locating Sinstat in the NRC made a difference compared to what it might have been if it had been located in a federal agency? Has it made a difference with regard to uh, its impact on policy? Has it made a difference with regard to its impact on the development of the social sciences? Um, a related question which you may not be able to answer, but I think um, the three of us are going to need to attend to. Would the NRC be different if since that wasn't there? Um, so that's the first question. The second question is actually a variant of the question that um, my colleague Jane Mayenshine raised yesterday. Um, how could we historians find out whether any academy or NRC report had been efficacious? That is, whether it had affected anyone. Um, it's a difficult question to answer historically, and actually I would include the profession of history in your critique of the social sciences. Uh, you don't know how to do it, and we don't know how to do it. So my question is, how might it be done? Well, let me, let me start with the, um, the question of uh, uh, that in the academy and what difference that makes. Um, what clearly happened at the time was that the Statistical Policy Division of the Bureau of the Budget, or OMB, was discredited by um, the data bank controversy, and the, um, both the Nixon and the Johnson administrations were, were, you know, were sitting on a hot potato with this, and, and essentially the Academy um, uh, came to the rescue um, through the, you know, or after the Wallace Commission. So, in fact, it was a solution to another, another problem. Uh, and the, frankly, the Statistical Policy Division never recovered the strength that had, had it in the 40s and 50s, you know, just administratively compared to um, what happened afterwards. It's a different story. Um, it, and it took the, Academy, I mean, since that also went through a kind of developmental phase, almost of a, probably the first decade, um, until it sort of found its sort of sea legs and, um, and became the kind of, um, uh, in some ways, powerhouse that it is now, right? Um, the, um, 
as far as I know, we haven't written um, either, you know, the, either the history um, of the statistical policy division of the history of SINSTAT in relationship to it or another. And so this is very much a kind of open question. Mike may be able to say some things as well. Um, so in fact, it was, uh, I look at the creation of SINSTAT as a solution to a, a problem that actually over time allowed the development, like Mike was talking about, of um, the microdata sample revolution to occur. Okay. The, the question of the, of, uh, the, the, the Ken raised and, and, and um, um, we're now discussing about how do you measure policy impact. Um, there's a Society for Policy History that, <laughs> that of people who work on this issue. It's not, a, um, it's not an easy one. I would give you one example because we're dealing with, you know, very close um, issues right now. Um, I've argued that the, in fact, you know, the constitutional provision for a census is a policy. In other words, we collect evidence, namely the population of the United States. We then turn those, that evidence over to Congress um, uh, in a report. Congress, in fact, then reapportions seats in the House of Representatives and the Electoral College every 10 years, and we've been doing it since 1790. That's a policy, right? So we, um, we've also learned how to measure poverty uh, as both a scientific process and a political process over the past century. I could talk about that and the role of the Academy and the Senate and so forth in that. And we use that poverty measure to trigger all sorts of social programs. So in fact, there is, there are ex lots of examples, I think, where we, in fact we could do sort of, you know, the kind of empirical research that Ken, I think, is ultimately calling for. So let me stop there. Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, after you. Um, so, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, I don't have any, uh, any clue on the policy front, and I'll let Ken address that, but on the, since that part, I think it's different because it's in the NRC, precisely because it's then a bridge between the users in the academic community and the producers and users in Washington. And therefore, it has an advocacy role that allows academic uh, interest and academic concerns to be uh, placed in front of agency heads. The other point uh, that I didn't make in my remarks, though I think it's also extremely important, is that by providing advice from independent experts, I think that it gives both political and, uh, uh, cover and substantive uh, improvement to the choices that the, that the uh, federal statistical, the people running the federal st statistical agencies are making. So in my time on since that, we've uh, talked end endlessly with the people of the Bureau of Labor Statistics about how to measure price changes. The consumer price index is still collected uh, or still calibrated by asking people to fill out diaries about what you buy and what you pay for it in this era when there are databases of credit card swipes and other things that might provide a higher quality, more precise data. And so members have since that's put this in front of the people who uh, make these calculations that drive all kinds of things throughout the federal government. Um, and, uh, and say, can't you start thinking about these kinds of things? And so we put pressure on, on the agencies and also when they say, well, but how would we do that? People have ideas about how to do that. Okay. Let me just follow up exactly on what Mike was saying. Um, big data, we've all heard a lot about big data. It is big and it's happening. It's gonna happen more and more and more and so forth. We're gonna make more and more social policy decisions based upon big data. Um, where does big data live in the federal government? Currently, it lives in computer technological departments and program departments. It does not live under statistical agencies. Statistical agencies understand representativeness. They understand accuracy in, in error terms. They understand 
uh, uh, the privacy company, al algae question, and so forth and so on. The current people managing the big data stuff and trying to use it don't have that stuff in their head. It will be, I am convinced, a National Academy of Sciences report, NRC report, which is going to lay this kind of argument out, and that's going to help the government realize the stakes of where do they house this new incredible capacity to learn about the society just by you know buying stuff from Google and Facebook and with their terrorists there and so forth and so on. Um, so that's the kind of role that could, that, that's what a SINSTAT can do, and, and just to generalize that, I, I think the National Academy and the NRC is unique. Now, I don't use that in a kind of a, a, a congratulatory way. Almost everybody's unique on one way or the other. But it's the nature of the uniqueness that matters. It's that it is the best science in this country, and that's how you get into the NAS. And it is an, aid, an implementation strategy with the NRC and the consensus reports and the peer review and, the re, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when it says something, it has kind of credibility that, that an agency on its own could never have. I was director of the U.S. Census. We spent a lot of money on National Academy reports feeding us, and it gave us backbone to, to um, we, I could not have paid for that. I paid for it, but I mean, I could not have hired those 12 people. I couldn't have put them on the payroll. They, I couldn't afford it. A million dollars was cheap to have, from my point of view, as the director of the census, to have people like Michael and Bob Bell and Bob Hauser and a whole array of, of people uh, spending weekends in this building or up at Keck solving my problems for me. And it, it just was inexpensive. Uh, I want to say quickly on the efficacy issue and your second question. Um, I, I think one of the issues is that as we launched our sciences, especially in the 19th, uh, middle, late 19th, early 20th, we took for granted that it would be used. It wasn't a problematic. It was an assumption. And it was a good assumption and a sound assumption. And it carried us through the war. Uh, it carried us in the post-war period. Um, and and we, uh, in the social sciences, the natural sciences that come out of the war, stronger and a stronger relationship between, w between the sciences and the, and the government. Um, and we didn't bother to ask the question because we kind of took it for granted. And then it was a surprise to these people who wrote this report in 1978 that they, they, they couldn't quite find anything except anecdotes. And they, as I say, they said they were uncertain. They just couldn't sort of demonstrate it. Things have gotten more complicated since then. We have all this vocabulary of performance metrics and impact and consequences and so forth. And so we're, we, we, we don't have the luxury of making the assumption. Um, now, how to do it is a quite complicated story. This is only a preface to that story. It's not the answer to that story. But at least there is a research agenda in here and also a training agenda in here that if it could be implemented somehow, it would at least be a start. Since we're talking about big data, I have to confess that Big Brother has not turned on the timer. So <laughs> I, I'm winging it. We're okay? Hmm, we're okay? Okay. It's broken. It's, oh, it's broken? No, we're okay. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> what I'm wondering is, is it now the time to shift to the audience question? Okay, thank you. Um, we are now shifting um, the locus of the questions. Um, I have the, a question for Michael Hout. Okay. Uh, you said uh, how valuable the anonymized uh, data samples are, the 1% samples, and yet I read that it can be de-anonymized, that 87% of people can be uniquely identified uh, by their zip code, gender, and date of birth, and 18% of the people can be identified with lesser information. What's the consequence of that for the future availability of the anonymized data, and uh, what's been happening to people who make use of these de-anonymization procedures. Um, that, that's what I was alluding to when I said this disclosure analysis. The, 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 the anonymized data sets don't include zip code. And so that's, that's, the, that's the first uh, important thing to note. The other is that if you want geographical detail, you can get detail down to the, uh, to the census tract level, which are geographical areas of about 35,000 people, but if you get it at that level of detail, you don't know a person's precise age or their occupation. 
Um, and so you if you get more geographical detail, it's going to cost you other kinds of detail. And vice versa, if you want the age and, and occupational detail, you have to give up geographical detail. You usually only know, uh, for, for some of the big states, you know that, that they're in the big states. But if the state is so small, you only know that, for example, uh, a person's in New England, not whether they're in Rhode Island, uh, New Hampshire, or uh, um, Vermont. I don't know what the exact anonymization is. But you, you lose detail. And, and so these, these microdata, you can't find individuals in them. Now, other things, pulling together searches on specific, uh, specific names, and when you're trying to hunt down an individual, you can, you can find people, but you're not going to be able to pull out, then link that discovery to their, uh, to their record in the IPMs, or even know if they're in the IPMs uh, with any success. And I just add that I'm almost certain that the study you're referring to was a study done on genetic data. It was not done on. Well, can I just sure. Uh, um, the the 2,000 census that 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 um, counted 100, uh, 286 million people, uh, you only could find five or six things about them. Because that's the that's the that's that's not the that's not the CPS that's not the American Community Survey that's not the big samples. So uh, what you can know about them is how old they are, um, and those data also are scrambled at lower geographic levels. And what we mean by scrambled is uh, I might have made you your age, but I turned you into a black woman, uh, and then over here I have a, a a black woman who became an Hispanic male. Um, but her correct age, and so forth and so on. At higher levels of aggregation, the data are consistent, as we have the right number of white males, and so forth and so on. You're only talking six variables, gender, um, age, uh, uh, family structure, uh, and race and ethnicity. In, in the census data itself, it could, could have done that, that identification. So you don't know very much about a person. Yeah, most of the data I was talking about comes from the long form, which is a sample to begin with, not the full enumeration. I would like to make a suggestion, <clears throat> excuse me, on the larger question of how science can have an impact on policy, public policy. Uh, as I said to a colleague walking home last night, it's the same old question over and over and over again, and we do the same hand wringing. I believe the effort has been seriously handicapped by two notions, both of which represent a cultural hubris. One of the notions among our various scientific communities is that science is the only vocation that deals seriously with evidence in any valid fashion. The other handicapping notion is that if you want to influence public policy, you need to influence public opinion, which is why we talk a lot about communication to the public, all of which is very worthwhile. The missing thing is that in our society and in our political system, there is another venue, there is another profession that deals very seriously with evidence, and this is the law. In every federal agency on the Hill, the lawyers are consulted virtually first in policy, when policy issues come up. I've been very, I'm not an attorney, but I got to know the general counsel's office at NASA headquarters very well. Uh, in Congress, that is the most commonly found background for a member of Congress, is training in the law, and every congressional office has lawyers. We all know this. Well, the law deals with scientific evidence all the time, and most especially in tort litigation. Around the year 2000, the Federal Judiciary Center published a fabulous study, at least I found it wonderful, of how the federal court systems have dealt with scientific and technical issues that have arisen through tort litigation. 
it is, again, it's a fascinating study. It has historical perspective. It has chapters on statistics. Uh, we have, believe it or not, on our Supreme Court, a couple of justices who are keenly interested in these issues, beautifully articulate about them. So I would like to suggest that we are struggling to hold erect a three-legged stool with only two legs. There's the science, there's the public co policy making, and then there is the legal profession, which deals very much in evidence. And again, when a federal court deals with an issue of uh, um, uh, toxic exposure, let's say, uh, or a federal agency, the lawyers get a whack at it, and they consult not this scientific study or science magazine, they consult the tort history of that issue. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. You want to react to them? Yeah, I'm just, uh, yes, of course, you're completely right. And, 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 uh, but I, almost all public policy, 96, 7, 9%, 82, whatever, uh, is about groups in the society. It's about the unemployed. It's about the dropout rate. It's about the people exposed to toxicities. Uh, it, it, we, we make public policy about a population. The lawyers ask whether the policy or the regulation is consistent with the Constitution, finally. Uh, and that's, that's a separate process. But the, the design of that policy has to have in its head how many people are likely to be affected by what we are doing, the, changing the income tax structure or what have you. So from that point of view, it is, it is demography, and it is the social sciences, and, and it is also where the natural sciences and the social sciences come together, because the, we have a radiation panel. The radiation panel talks about uh, risk and e exposure to how many people, what kinds of people, workers, and so forth and so on. So you can't get away from, even when you introduce law, you can't get away from the questions that are put on the table for the policymaker about what will happen to how many people if we do it this way rather than that way. No. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Anybody else want to? Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to go back to big data. The public perception of big data in the government is the security uses. Um, the phone logs, the whatever. How do the statistical agencies get involved in big data and not get involved with that perception of the use of big data? Uh, this is a goodie for Sinstat. <laughs> right? Now this is, where, this is where the Academy and Sinstat, I think, really need to sort of wade in. Um, the agencies uh, deal with this you know, like right like this, right day to day. Um, and for, um, and actually I think they're, um, you know, for just for my own sort of um, ethnographic work with the Census Bureau, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very hard issue day to day when one agent, when another agency, for right now the National Security Agency, is being uh, uh, exposed in the um, the press uh, about violations of uh, privacy and uh, and confidentiality of of data, and how someone in a different in a statistical agency copes with the the sort of overflow of that. In some sense, that's the story of the data bank um, issue because what you were what the the uh, and the the, uh, not the data bank, the, the population registration it, uh, uh, proposal in the 40s was. That was designed to be an administrative system, which would, of course, had, have had massive research um, advantages had it been built. I mean, the, we would have all loved it. But it was, um, it very quickly ran into the, you know, essentially political problems in such a way that it was shut down. The, Right now, you've got, uh, you know, what I fear is actually net damage, which is why I want Sinstead to think about it, um, it's damage to the statistical system from coming from the sort of fallout of things like the NSA uh, revelations. Thank you. 
that may not be an answer, but let me start with I that. I just add a footnote, though, to that. Um, I, the thing about science, which we love and worship almost, is the process of producing the knowledge is as transparent and accessible uh, to our audiences, whoever they are, as the knowledge itself. So if you run an experiment, you have to, and if you do historical analysis, you have to cite blah, blah, blah. The process is as important. With respect to an awful lot of the big data that's coming out of the, especially the social media, the algorithm that produces the knowledge is proprietary. So we have the odd situation of the federal government having to negotiate with a set of private actors who collected the data for altogether different reasons and intend to use it for altogether different reasons, and getting from them uh, this tracking of this whatever, phone calls or travel arrangements and so forth, with an algorithm that itself is not available, which means we do not understand the fundamental methodology that's producing the knowledge. I think that's a very major question uh, for, for a place like this. You wouldn't let a graduate student do it. That is right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, since that meets in this building next Thursday and Friday, on our agenda are at least two big data items. We're going to revisit the issue of card swipes and uh, the consumer price index. And we're also going to be discussing electronic medical records that will uh, soon be uh, flooding the internet uh, as the, uh, as part of the Affordable Care Act. and what social scientists, epidemiologists, public health, and the federal statistical system can learn from compilation and, uh, and uh, sampling and analyzing those data are on, are on our agenda for next week. Public hearing? Parts of the meeting are public and parts aren't. I don't think either of those discussions are, but there will be a seminar on Friday afternoon that's public, and I don't remember who the speakers are or what the topic is, but when we have something to say on these other two things, they'll be the subject of the Friday afternoon public seminar. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Please, we have time. Thank you. Um, we hear a lot about big data, and um, for those of, of us with training in information sciences or information services, we know that data leads to information, and information presumably leads to knowledge. Um, my concern is that with all this big knowledge, that we still use antiquated classifications. A case in point is that of race, and um, it's, it's very amusing to me that the census would use the word race. And since we know scientifically there's no such thing as races of people, we still infuse that assumption in our population, therefore complicating um, demographic tensions and ethnic tensions. Um, and I'm wondering why we will not update our classifications to be more ethnocentric, since we know that all human beings are human beings. I mean, there's no such thing as race of people. So we say white, we say black, and all these kind of things continuously today, in spite of the fact that we have uh, global knowledge uh, with the global genetic uh, survey that traced the genetic migration of humanity throughout the course of history. But we still say race. Um, and I think that's a tragedy. At what point, as social sciences, as historians, as scientists, we're going to stand by the knowledge that we represent from a global perspective and start dealing with human beings as fellow human beings, albeit with various ethnocentric or Euro-ethnic or Asian-ethnic um, historical legacies, that we can finally put this whole issue of race to rest. I look okay. at the panel can, and can conclusion. Can we try to answer, please, Just in the let me time conclude. Where we... Let me summarize why I'm saying this. When I look at the panel, I don't see white people because I know each of you individually have a strong and very proud ethnocentric background with all the cultural and linguistical legacies to go with it. I think we do ourselves a disservice by continuing to use that euphemism as white or the euphemism as black 
to our humanity, okay? All right. Okay. I've just been, written a book, just finished a book, uh, published a month or two ago, called What is Your Race? The Flawed Effort of the Census to Classify Americans. I will not summarize that book at this point. I'd be more than happy uh, to talk to you about it. Um, the Census Bureau has underway a very massive experiment right now about how to change the question for the 21st century, so it is very active. Uh, the CENSTAT has a panel looking at that experiment and so forth and so on. So I, what I just want to say to you, sir, is that there are people that have your questions in mind struggling with this question. It's a very political, a very political set of decisions. It's not a decision that's just statistical or technical or scientific. It goes to the heart of what kind of society we, we think we are and so forth and so on. So I'm more than happy to talk to you afterwards, but, uh, but I can't summarize the whole big argument today. Susan. Yes, I just wanted to add that on Wednesday, the NAS Committee on Scientific Programs approved a Sackler Colloquia entitled Drawing Causal Inference from Big Data. It's being organized by two members of the National Academy of Sciences in Psychological and Cognitive Sciences and um, Applied Mathematical Sciences and a member of the NAE in Computer Science and Engineering. Be an interdisciplinary meeting, and since all of you are on my mailing list, you'll get an invitation. <laughs> Thank you. It'll be, it'll be at least a year out. It's a year out, did I hear you, sir? Yeah. 